So we took a few episodes off to avoid the dreaded boy who lived burnout, but it's time to dive back into the wizarding world of adaptations by casting What's the Differentatum on Harry and the gang's fourth and fifth year at Hogwarts. Without further ado, and no restraint on spoilers, wands at the ready, it's time for Harry Potter and the Goblet of the Phoenix. Now, keep in mind this is not an exhaustive list of every tiny little detail that changed from the book to the movie. This is more a look at why certain changes were made and what those changes mean for the series as a whole. Starting with book four, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, the books really begin to get longer, so more events from the novels are cut wholesale than in the previous adaptations. While both start with the caretaker of the old Riddle estate stumbling onto Lord Voldemort and Wormtail, the movie leaves out a great deal of the backstory. The book shows that the Riddle family was mysteriously murdered almost half a century ago. I do like a mysterious murder mystery. <laughs> Don't we all? But by the time the caretaker is murdered, awakening Harry with a pain shooting through his scar, Harry is still at the Dursleys, anxiously awaiting the end of summer. And after a chapter of Dudley's real fat jokes, the Weasleys have come to pick up Harry for the Quidditch World Cup. In the movie, Harry wakes up with his scar pain, fresh off his mysterious murder nightmare, already at the Weasleys' home. Hermione is shaking him awake as they're behind schedule for a surprise outing. It's not until they take the port key and actually arrive at the Quidditch World Cup that Harry knows where they're headed. Either way, the first five minutes of the movie cover the first 100 pages of the book. These large cuts continue through the entire adaptation in addition to the usual trims to the more insignificant world-building details from the book. We don't see nearly as much of Harry in his classes or learning anything at all, really. The movie also skimps on some detail of the Quidditch World Cup and about the Ministry of Magic. While Rowling's books never stop adding texture to the Wizarding World, the world of the movies feels mostly established at this point. The movie also leaves out several of the novel's main players entirely. There's Winky, Barty Crouch's house elf who quickly gets fired after being suspected of conjuring the Dark Mark at the Quidditch World Cup, and subsequently inspires Hermione's efforts to start the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, a thread that's also dropped from the movie completely. The removal of Spew may also have made leaving Dobby the house elf out of the film a little bit easier, even though Dobby plays a highly emotional role later in the series. Other notable characters cut are Ludo Bagman, head of magical games and sports, who was a judge of the Triwizard Tournament, and Percy Weasley, assistant to Barty Crouch. The movie actually replaces these characters with a single change that happens almost immediately in the film. At the old Riddle Estate in the beginning of the movie, Harry sees Barty Crouch Jr. with Voldemort and Wormtail, while the younger Crouch wasn't present at all in this scene in the book. Even though we don't know his identity, we, along with Harry, can recognize Barty Jr. by sight, and the effects of this change trickle like woe throughout the movie. Because we've already been introduced to him on screen, we can actually see him conjuring the Dark Mark at the Quidditch World Cup, rendering Winky pretty much useless. His heightened presence in the film places more importance on the betrayal felt by his father, making fellow Ministry man Ludo Bagman redundant at Hogwarts. And as a result of Barty Sr. being more important to the film, he can't disappear for a large period of time as he does in the book. This also means that Percy's role as his stand-in is unneeded, and thus dropped like a bad batch of birdie bots every flavored beans. Once Harry is entered into the Triwizard Tournament, however, the book and movie proceed in mostly the same way. Piss off. Ron gets his panties in a bunch about Harry entering the tournament, and it isn't until after the first task with the dragon that they reunite. Then, Harry learns about Gillyweed at the last minute in order to complete the second task. In the movie, it's Neville that drops the hint, and in the book, it's Dobby. The old ball plays out pretty much the same way. Seeing our heroes struggle to talk to girls, much less ooh, dance with them, and Ron and Hermione's relationship status changes from just friends to it's complicated in a pretty serious way. They get scary when they get older. Ron, you spoiled everything! And of all the tasks, the third is the most different. The book features a sphinx and some of Hagrid's blast ended scroots patrolling the maze, while the movie features a much more cerebral task among the hedges. The mechanics of the story are rearranged in parts, but really they only differ slightly and in mostly insignificant ways. But before we end up just listing stuff, let's look at where we are in the whole series. If books one through three were about Harry growing up in the wizarding world a little bit more each year, Goblet of Fire is about coming into his own. It's about getting ready to take on the main thread of the entire series, 
Voldemort. Which makes sense because by the end of the year four, Voldemort is back to full strength. So it means that Harry has to rise to the final challenge. So in the interest in keeping that front and center, refocusing the maze as a man versus self type of task in the movie makes a lot of sense, as does cutting franchise favorite Sirius Black out of the movie almost entirely. Harry leans on Sirius quite a bit in the book, with Sirius actually setting up shop just outside of Hogsmeade and, towards the end of the book, communicating with Harry daily. The movie, on the other hand, reduces Sirius' role to one scene worth of ember-faced discussion in the Gryffindor common room. Distilling the book's narrative to focus on development into adulthood in the movie also brings up issues with characters and their parents. Hello, father. You are no son of mine. Barty Crouch Jr. obviously has beef with his dad for sending him to Azkaban, so this theme informs the front and centeredness of the Crouch family as well. But you also see it impact Neville Longbottom. In a movie full of wholesale edits of its source material, the story of Neville's parents being tortured into insanity by Death Eaters survives the adaptation process. It's also no accident that he's given the task of getting the gillyweed to Harry. It's a difference that reinforces the central theme of the fourth year at Hogwarts. It's time for these kids to grow up so they can fight Voldemort, this time in place of their parents. The book wraps up with a confrontation between Minister of Magic Cornelius Fudge and Dumbledore that lays the groundwork for the next book, The Order of the Phoenix, with Fudge flat refusing to believe that the Dark Lord has returned, and Dumbledore beginning to rally the troops. The movie, meanwhile, opts to end with a vaguely foreboding, but somehow optimistic, things are going to be different now, aren't they? Yes. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix picks up just a month after the events of the Goblet of Fire. Harry finds himself camped out underneath the Dursley's window at the end of a hot summer day, eavesdropping on the Muggle evening news, listening for anything fishy that might point to Lord Voldemort's activities. After hearing nothing, he runs into Dudley and his gang, who taunt Harry into a rich, lathery anger about all the frightened moaning Harry's been doing in the middle of the night. Just when Harry's anger bubbles over to the point of drawing his wand, <gasps> Dementors attack! Dum dum dum! Dementors? In Little Whinging? Y yeah, I know, that's what she said. Dementors? In Little Whinging? The movie skips straight to Harry wandering onto a playground on a sweltering summer day and being confronted by Dudley et al. But the Dementor attack and the events that follow it play out in the same way. Harry then gets a howler informing him he's been expelled. The book spends more time and more owls with more back and forth. First he's expelled, and his wand will be destroyed. Then he finds out about his hearing, then he gets a note from Sirius telling him to stay put, and then a mysterious howler addressed to Aunt Petunia shows up that says, Remember my last, Petunia? in a voice whose origins are not immediately revealed. Movie Harry skips straight to blowing up on Ron and Hermione at the Order of the Phoenix HQ. Something that has been simmering for 60 or 70 pages in the book. Also trimmed out of the film are the intervening weeks spent cleaning doxies out of the curtains at the Order's headquarters. The book also sees Ron and Hermione become prefects, and the continuation of Hermione's efforts with Spew. But this is where wholesale cuts in previous movies really start to impact the narrative of the overall series. For example, when Harry reunites with Sirius in The Order of the Phoenix, thanks to the cuts from book four, Harry hasn't seen Sirius in almost two years, if you don't count the objectively strange interpretation of the flu network in the Goblet of Fire movie. So their reuniting is given more weight in the films because, unlike the book, Sirius has not been a real presence in Harry's life since the end of the third year at Hogwarts. And there are several changes the movie makes to sort of play catch up in the Harry serious relationship department. For example, in the book, Mad-Eye Moody gives Harry a picture of the original Order of the Phoenix, including Harry's smiling, happy, unaware that they're about to die parents. The movie, however, gives this intimate moment to Sirius. Once back at school, Harry experiences the same cold and angry treatment from his classmates in the book and in the movie, but much of the year is either pulled entirely or condensed into montages. Do you ever stop eating? Oh, I'm hungry. Quidditch, for example, is removed from the movie completely, along with Harry's lifetime ban from the sport, while Dolores Umbridge's classroom inspections and educational decrees play out in a single sequence as opposed to being teased out over a much larger portion of the novel. The same is true for Harry and his friends. The dark arts lessons with Dumbledore's army also gets condensed more or less to one montage, and all the work that Hermione puts into jinxing the sign-up sheet and adding a protein charm to galleons as a means of communication are skipped entirely. And after Harry is along for the ride when Voldemort's snake attacks Mr. Weasley, the movie fast forwards through basically the entire Christmas break. And real quick, the scene in the book where they run into Neville visiting his parents in St. Mungo's, it gets me every time. 
His mom hands him that bubblegum wrapper and he keeps it. And then. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are, are you crying? You're not, you monster! Just pull it together, man. We're not even done with this episode. It's just a skipping Christmas on the closed word is one of the biggest crimes against Neville Longbottom in this entire series. I get it, the movies have other things to focus on, like Snape and Harry's occlumency lessons getting real bad, but man, this shortchanging of Neville really puts a knot in my wand. And it doesn't end here! It happens again in the Deathly Hollows when- Dude, we're not done with this episode. Save that juice. Right, right. So basically, the movie skips almost everything after the Christmas break. Harry and Cho's ill-fated Valentine's Day and all the subsequent feelings that Harry just couldn't understand are gone. Yeah, we covered all that boys trying to understand girls stuff in Goblet of Fire. Hermione's blackmailing of Rita Skeeter to publish Harry's side of the story in The Quibbler isn't even an option to include because they cut the bit about Hermione discovering she's an animagus who turns into a beetle from the end of Goblet of Fire. The movie does keep Dumbledore coming to the aid of Professor Professor Trelawney, but he stops short of appointing a centaur to the post of divination teacher. Which is a bummer because it makes this a little less tasty. Do something! Tell them I mean no harm! I'm sorry, Professor. I must not tell lies. What are you doing? I am senior under secretary to Laura! But perhaps the biggest cut is the gifting of Sirius's two-way mirror. The mirror gets no mention whatsoever, but still plays an important part later in the series when- Dude, save the juice. Ah, uh, okay, fine. From here, the events get rearranged a bit, but the climax of both the book and the movie play out largely the same. Essentially, Dumbledore flees in a very stylish and impressive fashion, the Weasley twins make their memorable exit from the world of academia, and Harry has a vision of Sirius being tortured. Good thing they kept in all that serious Harry stuff from earlier, right? Otherwise it's like, who cares? Well, yeah. So then, after Umbridge reveals it was actually her that ordered the Dementor attack back in the summer... A revelation the movie skips... Harry and his pals give Umbridge that less sweet than it was in the book comeuppance with the centaurs, then rush off to London for their confrontation at the Ministry of Magic, ending in Harry hearing the prophecy that neither can live while the other survives. Then all hell breaks loose in the form of a Death Eater sneak attack, and Sirius gets blasted through that weird archway. Although in the film, Bellatrix Lestrange clearly casts Avada a cadavera, so Sirius would have been totes dead no matter what type of weird archway he fell through, but the final confrontation between Harry and Voldemort has a much different tenor in the movie. Their conversation outlines the biggest lesson Harry is to learn in year five, that he has friends and he has love in his life, and that is a strength that Voldemort will never know. The book reveals this lesson in the very last chapter. Members of the Order of the Phoenix threaten the Dursleys at King's Cross Station, that the Muggles will be answering to the Order should Harry be mistreated in any way over the summer. But what's the point of shifting this scene from the Order standing up for their boy Harry to a realization Harry has while being possessed by Lord Voldemort? If we look at years four and five at Hogwarts as a transition from a grown-up-ish kid to a guy who's ready to take on a legitimately terrible threat, it becomes important for him to start standing up to those threats himself. Yes, Dumbledore saves the day in both the book and the movie, but giving Harry another moment to show he's ready to start kicking ass is crucial for heading into the final two installments of the story. Oh, and also the movie has the kids doing tons of nonverbal spells, which in the later books- Now, uh, 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 don't you tell me to save the juice and then start skipping ahead to book six. That's for part three of our What's the Difference Harry potter a -thon. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Hallows. Wow, that's actually a pretty cool title. I know, right? Make sure to like and subscribe and stick around Cinefix for more What's the Difference.